last year when I was in France. I took a look at the chanting book that the group had there. And they had the chant on the Brahma Viharas, the sublime attitudes like we have here. The problem was that in the French translation, when they got to equanimity, it wasn't all living beings are the owners of their actions. It was may all living beings be the owners of their actions, heir to their actions, born of their actions, related through their actions. It sounds like a curse. Think about people's actions. <laughs> the way most people act. It's actually meant to be a statement of fact. It's not a wish. It's a statement of fact. This is the way we are. Our lives are shaped by our actions. Our experience of pleasure and pain is shaped by our actions, past and present. And it is one way of developing equanimity, although it's useful to note there's a passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about ways of dealing with aversion. And one way is to develop equanimity, and another is to reflect on the principle of karma, that all beings are the owners of their actions. So for him, these were two separate things. I think what it comes down to is simply the, the fact that equanimity is a recognition that there's a lot in the world that you can't control, and trying to control it, trying to change it, is a waste of time. It's not worth it because you have to focus on other things. Equanimity is not a blanket indifference to everything. It's learning how to focus your efforts. Einstein once made the comment that there was the issue of why is it that most advances in the theories of physics are made by young physicists and not by old ones. And he was saying as the old physicists see many possibilities and many issues all at once that are interesting and might lead to new insights, whereas the younger physicists have an easier time focusing just on one thing and sticking with it. However, true that might be, it is noticeable that as you get older, your mind tends to scatter in lots of different directions. And you've got to learn how to gain some control of it. even. Before you get old, the mind has this tendency, especially now with the internet, where you can surf all day, follow one topic as it leads into another, into another, and just end up up in Helsinki someplace. What I've got to learn to do is see what's worth putting your effort into and learning how to put everything else aside. It's a matter of letting go of things that will not reward your efforts. Or even if they do, they're not as important as some other things. It's a matter of priorities. What's really important in life? And the Buddha says, focus right away on the issues of the mind, because those issues will be with you all the way through. As your various physical abilities go away, as your range of power goes away, it's like the world is closing in on you. Things that you used to be able to do, you can't do anymore. What do you do then? You can focus on the things where you, where you can do something, can make a difference. This is where you have to deal with your big responsibility. When the Buddha is talking about the issues of the Four Noble Truths, i.e. the fact that there is suffering and there's a cause and there's a path to its end, he's talking about things that you experience from within that nobody else can experience for you. Politicians can say that they feel you're suffering, but that's politicians. They'll say anything. You know that your suffering is your suffering. Other people can sympathize with it, and other people can give you condolences and try to do the best they can. It's like a child try crying uncontrollably. You hold the child, you try to carry it around, do everything you can in hopes that It'll stop crying. But you can't really reach in and change the child's suffering, take part of it away from him, from him or her. There are times when all you have to do is just watch and be patient. Well, that's the part inside you that you've got to be responsible for. Because when you are responsible for that, you're not the only one who benefits. The 
people around you benefit as well. If you can learn how to handle the issue of stress and suffering and pain inside by developing your own inner qualities, because that's the other aspect of the Four Noble Truths. That suffering is felt from within, and it's caused by factors you experience directly within, again, that no one else can see. And the solution lies in qualities that you develop from within. And this is a series of issues that will be with you all the way, so you want to get as skilled as possible in these issues. Then when you learn how to handle your own suffering, you're much less of a burden on others. So as you look around yourself, you see a, a large world with lots of possibilities. And it's tempting to want to take them all, all the different roads leading in all the different directions. There comes a point when maturity strikes. As someone said, the realization of death is the beginning of wisdom, when you realize, okay, you have only so much time. You have only so much energy. Where is that time and energy best invested? The Buddha actually talks about this in financial terms. He calls it noble wealth, the qualities that will be good for you. Conviction, in other words, conviction begins formally with the conviction of the Buddha's awakening. What that means is conviction in the principle of karma, that it's our actions that make the difference between finding true happiness and not. There's a sense of virtue, in other words, not wanting to do anything that would be harmful, learning how to restrain yourself from doing things that would be harmful to yourself or others. Well, here it's interesting to note that when the Buddha says, in killing and stealing and having illicit sex and lying and taking intoxicants, you're harming yourself. For him, harming others means getting them to do these things. In other words, you're respecting the fact that they too have their actions, and their lives are shaped by their actions. So you don't want to harm their lives by giving them the wrong ideas of what they should do. There's a sense of shame and compunction. This too is a wealth. In other words, if you think of something that would be unskillful, that would be harmful, and you feel ashamed to do it, you realize, okay, you're above that. You feel a sense of compunction is when you realize that you just don't want to see those harmful results. That can protect you from all kinds of unskillful behavior. Because when you do something unskillful, you can't, can't go back and undo it. No matter how much money you paid, you can't go back and undo a lot of these things. Which is why these qualities are a form of wealth. There's learning, and learning the Dharma as it applies to your life, so you can bring it up and use it when situations call for it. There's generosity. The fact of giving a gift broadens the mind, makes the mind more expansive as you take into consideration the needs of other people and try to help those needs. And finally, discernment, the ability to see what's skillful and what's not to see what is your business and what's not your business. This is where equanimity and discernment come very closely together. As the Buddha said, a fool tries to take on duties that are not his. A wise person takes on only the duties that are his. So you look and see, what are my duties right now? What can I do to make a difference in life, in my life and the life of others? It keeps coming back to the mind. This is your area, this area within you, that you directly experience. This is where you can make a huge difference, and you can always make a difference here, as long as you've got a breath to focus on, as long as you've got a breath to keep the body and mind together, even as the mind is leaving the body, as your consciousness is looking for someplace else to go and it can't stay here anymore. You can still do your best to do this as skillfully as possible. The Buddha talks about people gaining awakening at the moment of death. This is because they don't give up. And that struggling against things that they can't change, and they focus on things where they can make a difference. And one of the big differences is, where is your craving going around now? What things are you clinging to? How do you learn how to let go? There'll be a lot of things rushing in at the mind at that point. 
So you're, again, you have to learn how to pick and choose what are the things that are worth focusing on, which ones are not. So equanimity is a matter of keeping your focus where it belongs, keeping your priorities straight, and learning that although there may be a lot of things out there you'd like to see different than they are, a lot of things you'd like to see changed, or just a lot of things that you would like to explore, places you'd like to go. The mountains in the south of Chile, the mountains up in Baffin Island, well, they're awfully far away. You may have to decide, well, that's not on your itinerary for this lifetime. All the way to things that are closer. Issues in the family, issues at work, issues at home. These two will have to be let go. So it's good to get some practice in letting go. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration. You realize that there are lots of interesting things out there in the world, but the really important work is right here. What your mind is doing right now, what choices it's making, where it's focusing its attention, what it wants to change and can try to change, and other things that are not worth trying to change. We had an old man dying of cancer back at the monastery in Thailand. He was staying up in the jetty, and his faculties were going one by one. First he could stand, but couldn't walk, and then he couldn't stand, and then he couldn't sit. He finally got to the point where he couldn't talk. But there was one point there after we thought he was un wasn't going to be sitting up anymore. Someone came up and was basically moving in on the property of the monastery, cutting down some of our trees, laying claim to it as his own, he, and burning what they had cut down. He found out about this, and he got up and started yelling at them. And we told him to calm down. There's nothing that he could do about it anymore. He had other things he had to focus on. And he went back to his meditation. It's because he had been meditating that he could. But there was that moment where he forgot himself. So you don't want to forget yourself. In other words, look at what your abilities are what you can do, what's worth doing with those abilities. And seeing the other things that you can't change as not worth the effort to try to even think about them. That's how equanimity is a really useful quality to develop, even though it's not listed among the noble treasures. It's really valuable. <laughs>